Welcome to our latest version of the Discover Drones webinar with an emphasis on careers, specifically relating to uh, TSA and multi-GP. Uh, we're glad you've joined us this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. First, we're going to be doing some introductions. Uh, then we're going to be transitioning into drones and what kind of future careers they per uh, pertain to. Then we'll be going into drones and STEM competitions. And then finally, a Q&A, as I mentioned before, with both Justin Touchstone and David Roberts of Multi-GP. And then finally, we'll be doing a RubyQ launch bag giveaway at the end. And yeah, let's get started. All right, well, thanks so much for joining us today. We have two awesome guests that have driven and flown from across the country to be here. First of all, we have Justin Touchstone, who is local here in Idaho. He is our state advisor for the Technology Student Association. He taught pre-engineering for five years and has been pioneering the drone competition here in Idaho. So he's going to be sharing the work we've been doing in Idaho today. And then next to him, we have David Roberts from Multi-GP. He is fresh off of drone racing nationals in Reno but made it here today so he can share what Multi-GP is doing to bring drone racing into the scholastic level. So both of these guys have a wealth of experience with competitions in STEM. David's been working at the collegiate level with Multi-GP, working with over 70 colleges to put on aviation and STEM competitions. So both of them are here to share what we've been doing and what you can do with your programs to get your students involved. Right. Thanks, right. Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. You're welcome. So to get us started, why drones? Of all the things you guys could be putting your energies into, what got you into drones and STEM? Go ahead, Justin. Right. You start. Well, about, I'll go too long. <laughs> <laughs> about a year and a half ago, uh, Jim Schmidt from PCS uh, approached me and said, hey, we need to go do coffee. And uh, so I said, all right. And uh, we met, we, we started talking about it. And he says, you ever think about drones in, your, in the classrooms for STEM? And I said, not a whole lot. Um, and so we spent about an hour and a half talking uh, over coffee and uh, I started to kick it around and look at it and about a week later after that I received in my email a, a competition from, from another state about drones and I thought, you know, this would be something that I could get into the classroom and into my TSA, my Technology Student Association contest as a state contest. Um, it meets the criteria for CTE of being a uh, problem-based uh, competition, one that kids can, can get their hands on and build things and program. And so I thought it fit really well with what I oversee in the state. Mm -hmm. And so I, from there, I started to pursue drones in STEM and, and then PCS created a grant that sent drones out and uh, a bunch of my teachers received those grants. And so now I've got them in my, my programs and we're working to develop that. So it's an integral part of their, what they're doing in the classroom. Definitely. And David, what about you? What about your background? I it know you come from aviation. It was a bug that aviation. got me. Within um, MultiGP, we're a 22,000 member organization. We have 600 chapters around the world. Wow. We have growth happening rapidly because every time we throw a race, we have teachers and students and parents mm -hmm. coming up saying, what can I do to get this into my school? There's something here. And, and within MultiGP, we had long talks looking and searching for a STEM solution that was related to drones. Um, we know that we knew that there was an answer and we were so pleased to run into PCS Adventures. I, I guess the real notion behind what we see within MultiGP, you know, we're racing races and we have a lot of um, members that are, are going as fast as possible and it really takes a lot to be able to fly a drone. We take this one, it, it looks really complex, it kind of is. Even our yeah. Ruby queue, it's, it's pretty complex, it's kind of is. For a student to learn how to fly and get involved in one of these, we're pretty certain it instills a, an advanced critical thinking approach to mm -hmm. what they're doing. Um, beyond just playing a video game, this is a real absolute. The, the drone's gonna be built right and it's gonna fly, and then it's totally exhilarating, the technology mm -hmm. behind it, and we'll show you a little bit more about that. But we're pretty certain, and I think we're all in agreement here, that if a student gets involved and learns how this technology comes together, they're going to end up looking for a college that's maybe going to give them a little bit more technical education. Mm -hmm. They're going to work maybe a little bit harder to achieve and get that. They, they understand you have to really dive in. The great news is that at the end of their college career, we're pretty certain, we've seen it happen many, many times with our college students, they're going to be sitting in their graduating class. 
Mm-hmm. They're going to have a degree in something that somebody's going to pay them to do something. Right. So they're going to graduate and have a great job. It may be flying a drone. It may be working on something within the technology world. It could be that they're just going to be, have more refined thinking. They're going to be a mathematician. They're going to be a lawyer, but they're going to have a better style education. So mm-hmm. then they're going to turn to their parents. Or their parents are going to turn and look at themselves and go, holy cow, what did we do? How did we do that right? Mm-hmm. Now, I'm sure it comes with a lot of good parenting, but also the students have bid off on something that mm-hmm. once they understand that thrill of flight, it's going to guide them through to yes. the point where they have a great education and a, and a great career going. So it's, it's really fun to, to see the growth of someone, a, a student, mm-hmm. as they evolve from flying to go, getting a better education. So we, we really got the bug and we're pretty excited about having the Ruby Queue as part of our solution. Mm-hmm. Totally. Well, and that fits so well with what you guys try to do with career and technical education. Right. I mean, for folks who aren't familiar, career and technical ed is all about preparing students for post-secondary careers that are high paying and in demand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's great. We, we you know, and the nice thing is that we actually identified a college here in the state of Idaho that has a drone technology mm-hmm. a UAV program that that we can link these kids straight into their program. And they've been involved with this process as well. And we brought them alongside because we want them to be partnered. And yeah, all, career and technical education is really about that hands-on STEM learning, you know, taking skills that you can take, not just if I don't end up flying a drone as my career, I can still use those skills, you know, problem solving, mm-hmm. critical mm-hmm. thinking, teamwork, troubleshooting, all of those things that you learn. And, and I think this is a great platform to learn those skills. And even if they don't pursue this as a career, they can take those on into other careers. Absolutely. Now, for the students that do decide UAV piloting is their life, what does the career outlook look like right now for a drone pilot? It seems that there's a lot of demand, a lot of growth for something like that. I'm reaching into my wallet to see if I can pull out my 107 license, and basically that is a license. Here we go. It's a 107 license. It's like a pilot's license. Uh Someone must go through um, a a series of tests, just similar to what they're what they would do if they were going to be truly getting their pilot's license. Mm-hmm. But that allows them to understand critical decision making, reading the weather, working with air traffic control, understanding air spaces, um, mm-hmm. and, and it allows them to then be a licensed pilot. The reason I bring it out is in order to pursue and, or be a professional flying you and then get paid, you need your 107. So it's, right. it's, it's your professional license. So and all this still gathers towards that end. Mm-hmm. But the career outlooks, I mean, you got to think police, fire, yeah. insurance companies, uh, military, agriculture. agriculture. Ag. Uh, I know um, mining companies are using it, power mm-hmm. companies are using it. Uh, students at ISU graduate and they're getting anywhere from forty-five to ninety thousand dollars to be a okay. UAV really uh, pilot. So it's it's a really blooming feel. I think it's it's, it's growing, mm-hmm. um, and there's I think there's a ton of opportunities for these kids. There's also um, real estate or construction progress yep. inspection. Mm-hmm. A lot. The net of this is what's happening is we're we're able to have a def- different perspective. Mm-hmm. And if you think about um, when we say agriculture, you rise up above a field. Many times you look out at that North Forty and you can't tell that there's a dry spot in the very center. You yep. can't tell that over mm-hmm. in another section that maybe more chemicals would need to be used for, because it's getting eaten alive or something. So we're, yeah. we're increasing the output per mm-hmm. acre yeah. by using simple, well, it's not simple technology, but by using today's technology. Right. That anybody can use once you get a little education and know what you're doing, mm-hmm. it's accessible. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's the cool thing, what we're really passionate about PCS is helping people to see all the different ways drones can be used for good. Yep. I think that's a big part of the curriculum too, mm-hmm. is there are so many ways that haven't even been invented yet. Yep. It's moving fast. And so getting students involved in that innovation and thinking what else could we apply this technology to? Because every time we go present, someone says, oh yeah, I could use that at my farm to go see where the cows are getting out. Mm-hmm. Right. I could do this, I could do this. And so that's really exciting. I don't know if you guys saw even recently after Irma, The utility companies were using drones to go see where they needed to go in. I mean, Mm -hmm. all these cool stories are coming out, but people are using this technology to do things we couldn't do 10 years ago. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I know you guys have put a lot of work into developing a competition framework. Mm -hmm. So we have all these different pieces. How do you bring them together and how do you make it a community 
that students can really be a part of competing with other schools. So there's a lot to it. Mm -hmm. So I know both Justin and David have today some thoughts to share. And then after the webinar, we'll also be able to share this with you, whether you're here in Idaho or across the country and want to involve your students in a program like this. Let me start and then you run with it. The, the, the notion here is that if you have a school that's going to be bringing the Ruby Q system in, I like that modification there, so they're going to be bringing it in. It's great to have a classroom full of these where the students gather around together and they have their t small groups where they build this and they go through the dronology course, which is fantastic. They go through everything it would take to fly it. Well, then they've, they've completed and they're working within themselves, but maybe we can take a little bit further. Maybe we can have school versus school in a, in a drone challenge so that the students can begin pushing themselves a little bit further. So that's kind of what we were doing, I guess, with this framework mm -hmm. to, to push it further. Unfortunately, you have, anyway, I'll let you take it from there. Thanks, Dave. So what we started with was just, we looked around to see what other people were doing in other states. Um, and I worked with Michelle on this and I worked with uh, ISU, Idaho State University. Um, and so we, we wanted to keep it not just the exciting of racing, because that is the hook, that is what we what kids get excited about, but we also need to tie it into careers and into to STEM. And so uh, we broke this contest into multiple parts. And so the first part is gonna be a written exam for their knowledge, and they can get this information out of the curriculum that's been developed um, so that we know that kids are learning the laws around flying drones, the, the regulations that are around drones, the terminology, mm -hmm. safety. How do you safely fly drones around other people or in a group setting? And, mm -hmm. and so we really want kids, before they proceed to any other portion of this contest, to truly know what it takes to be a pilot mm -hmm. and, and to be a safe and responsible pilot. So that's the first portion of this. And it's going to be roughly 50 questions. We've been working with uh, some individuals on developing those questions. And so those kids will have to pass that. If they can't get through that, we don't necessarily want to put them out in a situation where people could get hurt and other things. That's so, part of that whole decision making. Yes. The, the, the students must, and everybody that's going to be flying, has to make sure that they understand. It's not just rules and regulations. It's a, it's a matter of safety right. and doing it right. There's certain things like you don't fly over the top of people. Yeah. 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 And that's common sense. And that's part of that positive grown <laughs> community too, yes. right? I mean, you want our students to grow up and be the next generation that right. just gets this from the get-go. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first part. And then we, we go into the second part and we broke this, the second one. It's a, I call it a flight challenge or a skills challenge. Um, they're not going fast yet. We're going to keep them in control. And really the first part of it is, is a safety table check. So when they go to a table, there's a safety officer there. They have to show that they can program their drone to re have a return to home. So if there's something going on, they can hit the button, bring their drone back. They have to be able to, to calibrate their compass, do a GPS lock, um, how to show that they can arm it, lift it off, do a line of sight in control flight, um, uh, activate the altitude hold and position hold, just all the little checks to make sure that they really understand what this machine can do and how to program it and take care of it. And so that they're, they're very familiar with what's going on and that they have control of their machine at all times. And that's, mm -hmm. so if they can't get past that, if they can't show those skills again, we're, we're not necessarily gonna put them out where they're gonna have a, um, a failure that could be could be catastrophic and we don't want that. We want these kids to have success, but we need them also to understand that they need to be responsible for, the, for their drone. Mm -hmm. um, the second part's gonna be a, a flight challenge, a series of challenges, and this was developed with input from drone racers. I, I'm not a drone racer. I, I, I'm hoping to get into it someday. Come on. Uh, <laughs> as soon as I can convince my wife to spend the money on a, on a drone. But. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we, we sat down with some pilots and uh, we, we kicked out some ideas and they said, oh, that's going to be too difficult. And so we, we've worked this around quite a bit. So we've developed three levels. And so we, uh, we have a novice level where kids will go out or, or the pilot will go out and they'll fly just around one flag and then land their drone. It's just a simple out and back. Kind you know, of there's still a lot to be said about that in that we want to achieve success yes. in yes. a simple exactly. flight. Right and come back and say, yes, I did it. Yes. Um, so just having the novice, that's, that's fine because they can get around and come back and that, right. there's still a big challenge to that. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I, that would be a hard challenge for me at this point <laughs> to, to, to accomplish. So, um, And then the next part would be to fly out around 
a flag and do a slalom coming back. So it'd be a two flag with some curves in it. To, There's always that school or always yes. that team that's going to try a little bit harder. This right. is going to be better for them to, right. to or compete with that one within. pilot that just picks it up and right. is, you know, the next speed racer. Mm -hmm. You want to challenge them for sure. But part of it is just the pilot and then the line of sight person. Mm -hmm. And there's a third team member that's going to be gathering the data. Yep. And, and then the support team back behind them. Yep. And that's a good point too with this FPV, with first person view, hey, no one's doing this. Can I show what that is? Do you mind if I show a little bit what first, can we just break the system down real quick to talk about what first person view is? Yeah, yep. so absolutely. So just real quick, I'm gonna jump in the middle of the menu or our agenda, but here's our here's our Ruby queue, and there's two different systems happening here. Basically the system that makes the aircraft fly where we have the power distribution board then the flight controller that's been programmed. You mm -hmm. dial it, you put it into a USB port and, and go into the computer and you make sure that everything's all properly tuned. And we show how to do that. Mm -hmm. But that's the flight mm -hmm. system that works. And you can see right here is the GPS Mm -hmm. module um, where on the radio that we're working with at any point if it got goofy you can stabilize it and say okay come on home it's truly using GPS signals yeah. that are coming to triangulate to know precisely where it is in fact if you just hold it there and it's locked in a GPS and you pull it back it's gonna come and lock back into its place mm -hmm. so that's the one system another you're gonna see this camera on the front well we have um, taken a camera with a video transmitter that sends a signal out through this antenna, and I brought my goggles in. This is the way the pilot would fly. They put this, these goggles on, and so when they're flying, they receive a video signal from the antenna that then feeds it to their eyes. So the perspective of the pilot mm -hmm. is from on board. Yes. Once a student has done that, once they've had a chance to do that and go out and have either flying and their bit. It's really, really exhilarating. And that's called FPV or first person view. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the trick here. We have one of the drone re drones we were using at the national championships in Reno that we were racing. And so there's a little bit more modern. This will go to zero to 70 in, in about three seconds. This is the advanced, way advanced. We're not going to be working with those, but we'll be working with, of course, the Rubik's Cube, which is, is a little bit more moderate version. It's, it's pretty fast. It'll yeah, still move if you need it to. It's, it's really fast. But I just want to jump in the middle no, of what that whole FPV good. and a little bit about technology. Oops, sorry, right. that. Well, and the other cool thing about flying FPV is when you have those goggles on, you can only see what the drone's seeing. So right. you have to have a teammate, a spotter next to you oh, yeah. who's communicating to you. The and so there is person. a real yeah. teamwork, mm -hmm. and you really mm -hmm. have to trust that member of your team that they're going to be helping you out, giving yeah. you the information. Usually, I think you probably want to have two or three different people that have the opportunity to fly so that mm -hmm. that line of sight yeah. person is also a pilot. Yep. Right. And then the third person would be that data collector because there, there's a lot happening between the pilot and the co-pilot, if you will. Right. And the data collector saying, okay, what did you see? What was happening there? And just guiding him through. Mm -hmm. And that's and that, I think, is the really neat part about the drones is the teamwork aspect. Mm -hmm. It's not just yeah. an individual doing the competition on their own. They, they actually have to work together to solve the problem and to, to achieve what they want to achieve. And so the last part is, is really almost setting up a, a small mini course for like what a race would look like mm -hmm. so there'd be some gates and some flags um, and that's that orange line through the the picture that you guys are seeing on your screen and so we really want to make sure that these kids can have success at these different levels and they would be judged on okay how well did you fly out there and mm -hmm. come around Could, did you achieve it um, and the scoring mechanism would, would rate them on that and then um, and from that the other piece that that we worked on was to really make this not just about flying a drone, but mm -hmm. really about mm -hmm. understanding what I can do with this knowledge that I'm gaining in my classroom and where can it take me in my, in my life. And so we, we mm -hmm. added in a portfolio um, uh, and it has the various components. So we want to sh sh uh, have the portfolio show that these kids are out flying in the classroom. They're outside. Maybe they partner up with a multi-GP chapter in their mm -hmm. area. Oh, we'll um, get to that. We'll, let's talk about we'll, that. We'll I think that that's an important thing. Yeah. And so, so these kids are getting those experience and showing the flight hours because that's going to be critical. Um, safety certification, showing that they're they're yeah. registering with Multi GP and with mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the, AMA? the the AMA group because mm -hmm. um, the, the Academy of Model Aeronautics, yes. and that actually cover, carries um, just insurance. Yeah, it carries insurance mm -hmm. for them. Um, and so, and then present it. And the, the other piece to this portfolio is going to be a STEM problem challenge, is what we're calling it right now. Um, but they'll be required to look at what a drone could be used for to solve a problem within their community, within the state of Idaho, in the nation. Um, you know, how can we use drones in a way that haven't been, how they haven't been used in the past? And yeah. so getting kids to think about 
Where could this technology take me? What could I do with this Isn't technology? Isn't that part of the written that they, yep. that they asked that the portfolio. question, what, yeah. where could this be used? Where and... could this be used? And they'll have to research a problem. They'll have to identify how they could build something, uh, build a drone that would respond to that problem. Because a racing drone is different than a drone that goes out and gathers information about, sure. about fish or fires or whatever else. And they, they look different and they function different. But how could a kid design something from what they know about this and building it in the classroom? actually thinking, well, how would I go out and actually design something that might might work in that realm? And then reporting out to a, a panel of judges, and they would be, mm -hmm. be graded on that. And so that's tying it into that careers. It's tying it into the STEM. It's getting them to, to think beyond just a race drone into a bigger, the, the world, the bigger piece of the, of the pie. Um, and then from that, we would, kids who get all the way through this and they're ready to go, we would have a, a race. Um, a PCS spec race or, or the Ruby IQ spec race. Um, I will t tell you that some of the feedback that we've had about the Ruby Q, they look at it, an educator will look at this and say, I love this project based approach to learning. Mm -hmm. This is what my principal, this is what my superintendent has been telling me to, to come mm -hmm. up with. And, and here we have this awesome um, curriculum that you're going to probably talk a little bit more about how sure. that fits in. But some of the feedback is, this is really neat, that's really great, and I can see how that gets the kids' attention. But I don't know anything about drones. How, how, how do I get to the point where I can take this curriculum that they can understand, they know how to work with, but how do they get to the point where they can be comfortable as an educator with this Ruby Cube? Many times what we've seen is the teachers will maybe do, they'll take the curriculum and do a mini module, if you will, where mm -hmm. they just, they, they introduce the, the Ruby Cube, they introduce some of the just minimum notions make it a short course in preparation for then having a full semester of learning. Because your curriculum has, you could just carry on and on for probably about eight or 10 weeks, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely. For a full semester. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you think about the drone racing community, but my impression has been that this is a really tight knit community where folks help each other out, that there is some real excitement here of, yes, we want to bring people on board, we want to share what we know. Well. We have a saying within our little community, build, fly, crash, repeat. Yeah. That means you, you go out and you fly hard, and these things are nearly indestructible. If I was really fancy, I might throw it across the room just to show you how it, 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 nothing would happen. We'll just keep flying. Um, but with that, we're kind of humbled. And we know, yeah. oh, shoot, blew up a motor, had an ESC problem, stopping, what happened? What happened? So we're doing quick problem solving. And everybody else steps in as well, saying, let me help you with this. Hey, you might have to do this, and else here's my soldering gun, or that you need to, so we're kind of a tight knit in that we are equally humbled. We constantly, we're not constantly crashing, but we're constantly challenged mm -hmm. to, to achieve, to go better. And it's not just always about racing, sometimes just freestyle flying. We're just going fly, flopping through the sky and it's still really exhilarating to get up there at the top of the tree and surf down the front of it. But we're all still rooting for each other. And so that's when we bring the students in, they're gonna be it just, you're brought in. Nobody says, oh, you're not, it's all, it, come on, let's sit down, let's fly. Mm -hmm. So. It's, it's a good group, if that's what you're looking That's what you're asking. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, and what I've seen that's cool at the races, too, is that you have all ages. Mm -hmm. I mean, you oh, have yeah. some pilots that are 14, some that are 40. So this truly is middle schoolers, high schoolers. It's all about your skills. You know, we have 14-year-olds that show up and they've built their own. We also have 14-year-olds that show up with their parents, mm -hmm. a mom or a dad. And there's, they, it's, everybody has a different skill level. Um, and, and actually, it's usually the 14-year-olds that are really, really good. Mm -hmm. but, at our drone, nation, drone racing national championships that we just mm -hmm. held, we had 150 pilots from all over, mainly all over the country. We had some people from Mexico and maybe Canada that came cool. in. And the awesome thing about this is in the top 10, I think five of them were under 20. Mm -hmm. The wow. winner of the all, the one that took $10,000 prize, 17 mm -hmm. years old. Wow. My buddy Evan from mm -hmm. Heads Up FPV, he's 14, I think he got fifth place. Wow. There was quite, it's, it, this place, this sport isn't necessarily for the older folks. It's for <laughs> the kids that are coming in and they're really, really good. We see kids that are <clears throat> down in the basements playing their video games mm -hmm. and, and they're constantly down there goofing doing that. And that's just great because they're learning quick reflexes. Sure. What we're doing with drone racing and with this Ruby Q challenge is getting those kids with those quick wits, with those, mm -hmm. that quick mm -hmm. way of thinking, we're getting them off the couch and outside into the real world. Mm -hmm. It's really great to see that because they're outside, they're working with other people, they're crashing in a real world way, but it doesn't hurt anybody. They just mm -hmm. go in and you problem solve, fix it and go. So we really are excited that we get those kids running yep. on something that's so real and has such a brilliant future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it oh, it's growing. 
So, Justin, if we have folks who are in Idaho now mm -hmm. and are saying, great, you've got these 22 teachers, they're coming together, what do they need to do if they want to participate? And maybe both for folks that are a part of TSA or folks that aren't yet, um, what do they need to do to get involved? Um, here in the state, if, they're, if, they, if they have a technology education program that's under CTE, they can, they can re affiliate nationally with TSA and become a TSA chapter in the state of Idaho. And that would notify, I get a notification when that happens. I get an email mm -hmm. that says, hey, this school is registered. And then I know that they're, they're one of our TSA chapters. Um, from there, they can just, you know, they can get a Ruby IQ and start going through it. Um, this contest will be, I think I'll have the final rough draft of it ready for people to, to, to view in October, probably the first week of October. We're gonna test it out with some teachers in a small mm -hmm. setting to kind of work the kinks out of it to make sure it's, it's ready to go. Um, but that would be available so they understand what they need to prepare their kids for. Um, that's, that's coming into TSA. Now, if, they're, if they don't have a technology, they don't have a CTE program, you know, we can look at what they have for, for endorsements in the state of Idaho. Can we get them to be a CTE program? If not, you know, we can, we're going to have kind of a separate registration piece where we're hoping to bring these, these, these schools in that have a desire to do this because we know that these drones have hit some schools that don't have a CTE program. And, and so we want to make sure that we're encompassing them. So we're looking at a multi-level kind of registration format where the kids would still be required to, to do these elements, but they would only be able to participate in purely the drone portion of our TSA state contest because it involves a whole bunch of different contests and leadership mm -hmm. building and stuff. So we're, we're trying to open that door so we can make sure that we're not denying them the ability to come and race there in the Ruby spec class for now. And and but they have still have to meet this piece so they can reach mm -hmm. out through you to me i, I can sure. get that information to them um on the contest and and then when registration happens we can get that information out as well so we'll provide those links where they need to go we haven't worked out the pricing fees yet or anything else yeah. but that will be coming well and that's great too because i know we hear from libraries or scout troops you know or after school programs are saying oh, well we're not really a school and so it sounds like everyone is welcome. Mm -hmm. The more yep. the merrier, and yep. we've got a way to get them in. That's awesome. Yeah, that's what we that's what we want to do. Well, that after school program that goes to what I was saying about just the mini course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, you take this curriculum and and turn it into a mini lesson or lesson series of lessons that still gets everybody understanding the safety, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. technology of flying, the decision making, and then how to fly and get up and going. Mm -hmm. But, um, the, and the, actually I think what we've seen is that the, those mini courses, of course, turn into something like, let's expand this a little bit more. Ingress. The success on it leads to further success within that program because people come in, it's like, what, do you, what are you doing here? Wow, this is neat. And let's make it bigger, better, faster, stronger exactly. next time we do it. And, and everybody feels a little more comfortable, so it becomes easier to make it bigger, better, faster, stronger. Right. Yes. And in fact, let's go from there to talk about, too, I'm here with PCS, and what we've put together is a set of resources. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about the RubyQ that's here. RubyQ is the drone that we develop specifically for STEM education. And again, you can put it together and take it apart. It's, it, it, if exactly. I may, it comes in this box right here where you have all the different pieces within it. I'll, I'll crack this open real quick. It has all the different pieces not put together. And so at the end of the semester, I think you take it apart and put it back in mm -hmm. so that exactly. it's all stowed so away it's nicely. Reusable. And this is the key part here because we didn't want a drone that was just a racing drone because right. that's a part of it. Sure. But as you go through and build it, like you said, if you're someone who's coming in, you've never done this before, you don't know anything about drones, you're taking it from the ground up, putting it together. Mm -hmm. And so as the STEM piece, right, I mean, there's so much going on to power a drone. The electronics that have to go on, the circuitry, the radio transmission that has to happen. The programming to get component. The video feed and the programming. So there's computer science, physics, electronics to really understand how this works. All of it. You have to learn all this background science. But it's it's practical. It right. all gets put to use. So all of a sudden they're learning something physics, which could be really really difficult. But they get they begin to understand that it's in play in how this thing goes to fly. And so it's fun and you're right. learning like crazy. Oh, and that's the thing. You have to know how the propellers spin because if you put them on wrong, your drone flips over and you're it's, trying to figure it's out an absolute, why. It, you know? it, it, it's one of those slap in the face of sorts of the absolute nature of life that you have to have this all right in order for it to work or it doesn't. And so it's gentle too that nobody gets hurt. Yes, exactly. Well, and that was the other part that was really important to us is developing a drone that had safety features. Mm -hmm. So if you have brand new beginning pilots, you don't really want to go zero to 60 in two seconds. 
You want something that you can get up, you can take your hands off the controls, it can auto level, it can return to home. If you have a student that says, well, I kind of lost control, no problem. Return to home and then as you gain your piloting abilities, you can get rid of those safety features and go into more and more challenging those. You know, in the dronology course, I remember Dalton was talking about some of the safety features. One of them would be that, I know that with the FPV camera, it actually is easier to fly because you're on board and you're like mm -hmm. Superman flying, and you know how to, yeah. if you go line of sight and go flying it too mm -hmm. far away, you lose orientation really, really mm -hmm. quickly. And Dalton pointed out, you only go beyond, you don't go beyond 100 feet when you're just flying mm -hmm. line of sight. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the, the dronology course really ties in nicely to leading people through to be better at their first flights and their second and third flights. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, Michelle, the other thing you know we're going to try to do at the state is an ongoing professional development for yes. the teachers who get these into their classroom so that they're not just out there going, well, I've got this thing and I'm scared to fly it. So right. if, I, if a teacher's scared to fly it, they're not going to be putting it in the hands of their kids. And right. so we, we want to grow our teachers so that they're very comfortable with this platform and they understand what it takes. So the other thing that I think, thinking about what you said, David, about FPV that we really like, because there are a lot of different drones. So a lot of people are most familiar with camera video drones, sure, right? Something mm -hmm. where you're capturing photos or videos. What we really like about FPV drones is that you really have to have piloting skills. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't going to auto fly itself along a course. Right. You are in control. And so in terms of gaining a real world skill and having something that's fun to fly, this was the reason we went with FPV, because there is nothing like that thrill of being on the drone mm -hmm. and actually having to pilot it. So that was another really important decision for us, that we wanted it to be FPV, first person mm -hmm. view, because that's how you learn to fly. You can fly one of these, you're going to be fine. The other part, too, that's in here is you can see up here our program comes not just with all the materials. You saw mm -hmm. in there the radio, the goggles, the batteries, everything you need, but also a full curriculum. And so this is going to guide you through, number one, I mean, the basics. How do you build this? How do you configure it? How do you go out and fly? But then also weaving in what's all the STEM that goes into this? What's the physics? What's the electronics? What's the real world applications of this? So David, before you mentioned dronology, um, this is a portion of the curriculum that we made online as a series of videos. So that specifically covers And that's the Bloom's ethics. taxonomy that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. that is employed there. And if I understand it, it goes according to National Science Foundation standards and ISTE standards. So we're really focusing on probably what the schools and the educators are looking for to mm -hmm. accomplish and, and to teach. Yeah. Right, and that's exactly it. So through the journology, you're getting that content knowledge, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. some base level knowledge that everyone needs to know about drones. These are the basic components. These are the safety concerns. These are the regulations. Everyone needs to know that. So some of that is going to be delivered digitally because that's an engaging way to get through it. We can integrate, you know, quizzes and that sort of thing. But absolutely with Bloom Saxony, you want to move beyond that, right? The next step is going to be applying that. So in the curriculum, you can see up there, it's set up as a series of challenges. So once you've got that base knowledge, of course, then you got to go apply it. So a series of flight challenges. And then that final level is, okay, can you innovate? Can you create something new? So kind of like what we've done with the STEM challenge, how mm -hmm. can you take this and apply it to the real world? What's a career you could integrate this into? What's a issue in drones right now that people are discussing? Take an opinion on it. What do you think our new mm -hmm. regulations should be like since they're still getting drafted? I would say yeah. two years ago, some of the ways that drones are put into place, how they're used, weren't even considered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I submit to you that tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we're going to come up with a whole nother way. And then when these students are saying, oh, here's something else I would do, mm -hmm. there's going to be ideas pop out of that. Yeah. It's going to make people stop and go, practically speaking, what could I do with this? And it's a great right. way to apply it and bring it all together. Right. Right. Well, and for students to see that, yeah, people are still figuring this out mm -hmm. and that they can have a voice as the ones that understand the technology right. to what rules make sense. And so that's kind of the third piece, the top of that Bloom's taxonomy. And then, like you said, of course, we align everything to ISTE and GSS all the kind of common standards that we want to support, because that's what's important to so many educators. Yep. And so this comes as a set of resources for you as you're going, okay, I've got this hardware. How do I turn this into a program that's going to work for a CTE educator, mm -hmm. for an after-school program? Obviously, everyone's going to craft it a little differently, mm -hmm. so it's meant to be really modular. Mm -hmm. So based on the age and the time frame that you have, you can make a really good program mm -hmm. out of this. So that's what we've got to offer through PCS. And then the final part is that this is the spec drone for the race. Mm -hmm. And so I know for multi-GP, 
this is really common at drone races because you want it to be a fair competition. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. You don't want some folks to have a really expensive drone, a really small one or different sizes. You want it to be about your skills, mm -hmm. not the equipment that you've got. Right. If you've seen drone racing on television, on ESPN, that would be a spec race where everybody's flying the exact same quad, mm -hmm. where it, then it ends up being a piloting skills. Mm -hmm. Right. If I may, just real quick on when we're talking about the, the drone racing competition, the specs on this is, has to be two hundred or five inches across and uses a four cell battery. Mm -hmm. So all the drones we just had were all custom built. Every single one, mm -hmm. you know, each of them were completely different. So they're choosing their propeller, their motor, the electronic speed controller, their flight control, all the different pieces. Yeah. But it ends up being pretty much the same it's just how they were tweaked, and then, then it's going to be the piloting skills. Mm -hmm. To get there, you, this is a perfect gateway right. to mm -hmm. better understand, because the technology, the methods, what we're doing, how the props spin, the electronics, all of that is the same notion. It's the exact same mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm. that then the student can grow and say, I want to do this on my own. I want to mm -hmm. go build my own. And that would be exactly. a natural, logical progression. Yeah. Yes. Or they could go with like the Thrust UAV, the Riot 250, mm -hmm. which is a bind and fly, where you just, you get the batteries, you get the receiver and get it going. That's maybe an intermediate, a next proper step. And mm -hmm. I actually kind of see that the building of the drone, there's, that's that advanced kid. Mm -hmm. That's an advanced team. And that's maybe the next generation of mm -hmm. the, the races. But the Riot 250 is a great approach to the bind and fly. When we had that further advance, they've gone beyond the Ruby Q. Now they're going to be in that fourth style of a race. Right. We're right. really, really, literally going to have them going out there and doing some of the, the tough courses that maybe we would right. be working with within, or they would be flying within a multi GP style environment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we appreciate all of you giving us a chance to share what we're doing in Idaho. We're just a little excited. We yes. are really excited. We want to have a chance to, to answer any questions, especially for folks that want to get this started. Mm -hmm. um, we're really at the stage where it's innovating and developing really fast. And so like Justin said, we're happy to share and just get mm -hmm. as many folks on board, testing this, trying it, bringing the competition forward. All right, well, we have some great questions here. We'll start off first with what kind of funding or grant opportunities are available for CTE teachers to engage mm -hmm. in a program like this? If you're a CTE teacher in the state of Idaho, there's uh, two streams at least that you can consider. One is added cost funds for your program. If you're under me, uh, most of my programs get just under $10,000 that they can use for equipment or other and training opportunities so they could pay, pay for the professional development. So you could put uh, a classroom set into your, your, your classroom, I mean, this fall, if that's what you choose to do. The other stream is a federal funding stream from Perkins. Um, and you can use that and that can be used to expand or grow or start a new kind of program um, and those funds are federal dollars so you would have to if you're a teacher in a district you'd have to identify who your cte perkins grant writer is and i could probably help you figure out who that is um, i'm in charge of region four which is twin falls the uh, middle of idaho in the south um, but each of us have a region so we can get you in contact with who that person would be that's federal dollars and depending on the size of your school there's there's usually a, a pretty sizable piece of money that's available there for your school as well. So those are two. And I know the STEM Action Center here in the state of Idaho has mm -hmm. put on grants in the past for, uh, for, for Ruby IQ to put them into mm -hmm. the classroom. And I think they're considering some additional new grants there too. So that would be another resources to go out online uh, to STEM Action Center, sign up for their newsletter because they send out, hey, these are the new grants we're doing, this is what we're doing, and then you can go through there. You know, I have it. a question for you on the typical grant application process. Mm -hmm. When you say that we're working with drones in the STEM mm -hmm. technology. It seems that that would be something that would be readily accepted. Is that the case or is it really competitive against all the other methods and the funding means? And, and the, Perkins, the Perkins grant is really, it's, it's federal dollars that we take as a state in, in Idaho. We take about $7 million. It's mm -hmm. spread out across all of our school districts. Um, and so within the school district, the teacher has to say, hey, go to their, their grant writer and say, next year, I wanna put in drones into my classroom mm -hmm. and it's gonna cost this much money for the, for the drones and, and for my professional development. They would write out what their costs are. And then mm -hmm. that individual actually fills out the Perkins grant and sends it into the state. And we would look at it and if it fits within the federal guidelines, we approve it. So it's not, the Perkins grant is not a really hard process. It's just convincing whoever your grant writer is in your district that it's something that we should be doing. Um, I actually have, I know of one school at least that has Put this into their Perkins grant for this year. They and uh, so they're they're already reaching out in that set of funds. So it's not an overly difficult process, but mm -hmm. that's where they need to talk to whoever that grant writer is in their in their district. I um, mean, as long as it meets 
the federal guidelines, which, you know, they, there's some restrictions there, but this fits well within our federal guidelines. I've, I've checked it out. I went to our Perkins expert in our office mm -hmm. and said, if I tell teachers they can do this, am I telling them the right thing? And they said, oh yeah, this is a perfect fit for what Perkins funds are meant to do. Cool. Just, so. All right, we got another one for you. So what kind of age range would Ruby Cube be appropriate for? And what kind of age range would apply to people wanting to join multi-GP? Mm -hmm. I can speak to the Ruby Q. So we developed this specifically with middle and high school students in mind. And so the reason is this is a high-speed drone. It's a complex piece of equipment. There are lots of drones you can do at the elementary level, but this is more advanced than those drones. So this is really with the complexity geared to older students. And then, David, you could probably speak to multi-GP in general. I would say it's just about the same age group that we have sixth and seventh graders that are coming through and struggling with trying to fly, but it at least gets them started a little bit. Mm -hmm. Usually, that's going to be they're going to be following along with the parent. We found the most um, from twelve on up, mm -hmm. the people are coming and stepping in to, to fly the advanced drones within and joining the multi-GP um, organization. All right. And then a more general question relating to uh, involvement in this kind of activity. What are the costs for registering a drone and what kind of costs do you incur to get the insurance through the AMA? Oh, those are two really good questions. I can speak to the insurance. First of all, we mentioned the AMA, the Academy of Model Aeronautics, earlier because they do have a program where schools can sign up. Um, the registration is free and for a very small fee you can get liability insurance for your entire site. So as your students register with the AMA, that is completely free and they get individual liability coverage. Up so a large amount of money. Up to, it's a it's, generous it's, policy. I think it's a $2 million policy so as, as an AMA member to... that they're covered for any kind of damage. It's a secondary insurance mm -hmm. policy, mm -hmm. but it's, it's actually required at any AMA sanctioned airfield in any multi-GP chapter race that we're going to have, AMA membership is required mm -hmm. just so that we have that insurance covered. It's just such an easy way. If the drone mm -hmm. were to crash into something, expensive. that's it's, it's, covered. It's totally reasonable because there's so many AMA members. And so that's part of the competition framework. Mm -hmm. It's written yep. into our curriculum. Have all your students register. And then that second piece is your entire site can be covered. So mm -hmm. on the off chance you have a new student come who somehow slipped through the cracks, anyone flying at your site is covered under that policy. So definitely check those out. It's the Academy of Model Aeronautics. We can get you the correct link because it's a great resource for educators. Mm -hmm. The other part they asked about the FAA registration. I'll get um, to that. You want to cover I, that absolutely, one, Absolutely, yes. I've been a member of the AMA for a long time. Um, and I've been involved with um, this drone racing and what we've been doing for quite a while. So we've, and I'm a licensed 107 pilot. So paying it, we had to pay attention to the whole registration process. To register your own drone with the FAA, there was a point a year or so ago where that was required if it was just above a certain weight. Mm -hmm. um, that has been waived. They, the Supreme Court ruled last year, a little, not too long ago, that registration of a drone isn't necessary at this point. It's, mm -hmm. So there's no registration at the um, federal level uh, for, for any quad. Which is kind of great. It is nice. And but you'll we want to make sure they go through the dronology course to understand mm -hmm. the decision making and, and all yeah. that. Exactly. And you'll still see in our curriculum, it is no longer required. We still recommend it just because it models that positive behavior. Mm -hmm. It's a $5 fee. One time you get a number that you can use for all of your drones. So whether you have one drone or 20, it's the same $5 fee. And what that does is it says that you're going to abide by all the FAA guidelines. And so some sites are still choosing to do it anyway, but you're right, it is no longer required, mm -hmm. which is great. Just mm -hmm. gives you a little more freedom. All right, we have a question specifically about the RubyQ drone. Is it a racer or observing drone? Maybe a blend of the two? Yeah, we typically say it's a modular STEM racing drone with safety features. So it has an FPV camera, but if you were designing a drone just to race, I mean, it would look like this. Yeah. So it has a lot of features on it. For example, it's probably the only FPV drone out there that has a GPS. Normally you wouldn't put one on there, it's extra weight. So it's kind of a blend. It has some of the easy flight modes that you would see on an observing camera drone, but it has the camera, the FPV camera for that style of pilot. The real world practical use of a drone is, is a challenge that you're doing. And that's really mm -hmm. where we're putting together this, mm -hmm. the drone challenge that it's, yes, it's going to be timed. That that's going to be a race going out to do that, just to add that little mm -hmm. additional element of pressure mm -hmm. to getting out and seeing and observing and bringing back the data and 
calculating and it gives us a chance then to see how the team is working together as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a bit of a blend and the challenge that we're putting together will be a bit of a blend. It's a race, but it's also a quality control thing that they have to go out and achieve certain yes. tasks and, and come back and report back in. So it's, it's a little both. Yeah. And we have one final question. This will be directed towards Justin. Can Idaho after school programs participate in the TSA drone competition? That's what we're, we're shooting for is that, that they'll be able to participate only in that portion of our TSA contest in, in, in March. It'll be March 8th, I say 8, 9, and 10, uh, that first weekend there in March. Um, so yeah, we'll open it up to, to those after school programs, but that's the only portion of our TSA contest that they'll be able to participate in is this drone piece. And that'll be a separate registration and we'll get that information out. We'll make sure that, mm -hmm. that uh, we share it through PCS. I think that'll be a good avenue with the people who are well, that group's invited. They, yeah. We want them to but be we want them there, participate as well. Um, because we want this thing to be to grow and to be a positive, uh, a positive thing in mm -hmm. Idaho. Mm -hmm. All right. Our final input here is from one of our current users of the Discover Drones program. His name is Paul Uzi, and he's from Mountain View Alternative High School in Rapture, mm -hmm. Idaho. He said that because of the addition of Ruby Q to his curriculum, you have parents becoming more involved in their kids' education. Yeah. And that's a very important aspect in an alternative awesome. high school. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. I've right. seen that we see that happen a lot. That mm -hmm. the student will say, I want to do that, and it's a great way. I, mom and son, mom and daughter, father and son, father and daughter. We it just we have all kinds of folks showing up to to get involved mm -hmm. and it's it isn't something that just one person in the family is going to want to do, probably. That the parent's spread. going to want to bring them. Yeah, it spreads. They, they realize it's a very positive thing. When they come to a multi-GP race, everybody's really excellent. They're very nice. It's, it, we, it's, a, it's a positive environment in the same, of course, would be with our, yep. our drone challenge kind of stuff. Yep. That just goes without saying. But it's usually, it, it, it expands and it brings in the family. And everybody knows that it's a real positive thing. We always get fast. We, don't, we, we always get positive feedback on what we're doing with this from the parents, that they like their child to be involved. All right, well, we're drawing the winner right now. Uh, we'd like you guys to hang around after the webinar, do a brief survey, and we'll send along a code for Journology. Uh, Michelle, maybe you can explain a little bit of exactly what Journology is. Sure. And uh, maybe incentivize them for getting that survey filled out. Sure. So we appreciate your feedback. A mm -hmm. lot of our development is guided by what we hear from educators. So if you take the time to fill that out, get back to us, what we'll send to you is an access code to get into Dronology. And this is what I talked about earlier, the digital portion of the curriculum. So what you see here on the screen is the interface. And so you can see there's a number of different um, courses that the students will go through. It'll cover different topics. And if you're thinking about getting into drones, this is a great intro, everything you need to know about the regulations, drone basics, and then to have a sense of what that experience is like for your students as they go through the course. It's so. neat that you have a video, tells a little bit, and then there's a quiz. Yeah, so they exactly. understand, and actually it's a quiz that has to be passed. You can exactly because I've gone through journalology, I passed it. <laughs> but it's really wonderful to have just the chunks of information that's laid out on that subject. Stop, think about it, take a quick quiz, confirm the knowledge, confirm the understanding, and move on to the next course. It's, it's fantastic you're making that available to everybody. And then it's something that probably the teachers, the educators should, could share with their classroom too. Absolutely. This, or Absolutely. the or their principals and everybody else to say, what is this? What what do you have going on? Right. If they see this, that's some of the smartest part of this old. Part, this whole curriculum is this dronology course. Mm -hmm. And it really is, yeah, it's a lot of technical information broken down into small chunks that are accessible even to students, right, that are going through and getting the knowledge you need. Mm -hmm. And our programs, we make all students pass the test at the end, become certified dronologists to show that, okay, I've got the knowledge I need to go out and actually fly. Thank you everyone for jumping on the webinar. Uh, we all appreciate you being here. We definitely appreciate David and Robert, or Excuse Thank me, you guys. David, and Justin, <laughs> David Roberts, and Justin Touchstone. Thank you for showing up with us. It's our pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank you. guys.